All right, Chair Rasmussen, the time is now 5.15 p.m. and uh, you can call the meeting to order. All right, welcome everyone. We're calling the uh, March Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission's meeting uh, to order. Um, if we could, uh, if we could introduce the folks who will be offering translation services for us this evening. Sure. Um, so members of the public, um, if you wish to speak uh, during uh, this item during any items throughout the agenda um, the instructions are provided uh, on the published agenda and uh, i will also turn on the spanish interpretation today for this meeting and uh, you can join that channel to hear uh, this entire meeting in spanish and i would like uh, my colleague um, uh, kenya cobos to provide these uh, instructions in spanish Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a todos. Gracias por participar. Si gustan, eh, necesitan interpretación en español, por favor, encuentren el icono del globo terráqueo momentáneamente. Eh, pulsen ese globo terráqueo y encontrarán el botón donde dice Spanish o Español para recibir interpretación simultánea en español. Gracias. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, if we could do our roll call, please. Sure. All right, we'll start with um, Commissioner uh, Huber-Levy. Here. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Mangtani. Thank you. Commissioner Agarwal. Is absent. Commissioner Bocanegra. Is absent. Commissioner Ginevra. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Greeb. Here. Commissioner Liu. Here. Commissioner Amaya Nori is absent. Commissioner Satwick Nori is absent. Commissioner Swope. Late. Okay, for now she's absent. Uh, Commissioner uh, Huila Hotel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then uh, Chair Rasmussen. And I'm here. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. All right. If I could get a motion to approve today's agenda, please. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Do I have a second? A second. All right. The agenda is um, approved. So now would be the time for public comment. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying no to worries. get no present. Worries. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Yep. I'm sorry. Do we need to vote on approving the Do we need to vote on Yes, we, you can okay. do um all in favor. All in favor yes. of approving the agenda as it's as it's been distributed. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, agenda has been set. And uh, we'll now do item number two, public comment. Uh members of the public, if you wish to comment uh via Zoom, please raise your hand now. Okay, I don't see any hands raised and there's no speakers from this room, so uh, no public comment. Thank you very much. And I do not see Supervisor Canepa, so when he comes on, if we could make him a call. Yeah, sure. All right, so we'll go right into system, um, updates from our system partners. And uh, first up, Ron Rance. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so the numbers for the past week since our last meeting, uh, we assigned 43 cases. Out of these 43 cases, eight of them contained 707B allegations. Uh, we handled the three ceilings, and then we received 28 calls on our Miranda uplines that we for consultations. Uh, another um, I think it's legislative time right now, and I know this issue is important to the uh, commission. And so there is SB 1353 by Senator Wahab, and then that bill modifies the Youth Bill of Rights, and it adds to it uh, the right not to be deprived of mental health resources which includes daily access to counselors, therapists, mentors, or any related services necessary for mental well-being and for or rehabilitation while detained in a general facility. And so it's a really good bill. Uh, we're tracking it and supporting it. So I wanted to bring it up. And the last numbers I wanted to share with the commission, I was doing some internal work and then I and assessing the numbers since the passage of Prop 57, which ended the direct filing by district attorneys throughout the state of California. In our county, we had eight cases that their petition been filed seeking transfer. Out of those eight petitions, six of them 
were adjudicated and so far none of them resulted in transfer so uh, great numbers i just wanted to share that with the commission thank you i really appreciate that the youth bill of rights and transfers to adult court are two uh, um areas that we are very interested in so thank right. you so That's... much for sharing that sure um okay and do i see um Nadia Han on uh, Zoom, if there's anything that she wants to report. If not, that's not a problem. But if there's anything she wanted to share. Hey, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, welcome. Okay, I think I'm having a problem with my headset. I don't have anything to report. Okay, well, thank you for being here. We certainly appreciate it. Sure, uh, let me just ask, ask quickly if there's any public comment for uh, Ron Reyes oh, thank you. Uh, for the private defender. If you want to raise your hand in Zoom, please do so. Okay, no public comment. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay, next up will be the report from probation, please. Hi, everyone. Today we have a population of 35 youth in our facility. Out of those 35, 31 are males, four are females. Uh, we have currently three out-of-county youths, one from Alameda County, one from Santa Clara County, and one from San Francisco County. On EMP, we have 21 youth that are being supervised. Could you say, uh, could you say your names for the record? Sorry. Sanam Aram, with a probation. Okay, and does anyone have any questions for Sanam? Hi, I'm Nora Cullen, Assistant Deputy Chief of Probation and Juvenile. Um, wait, let's have a naked evening. Um, I just wanted to report out. So for diversion um, or court cases or cases that are pending before process, whether they're being arraigned uh, in arraignment or waiting for free trial or whatnot, um, a total of 152 towards the month of February. And then supervision cases um, where they're actively on supervision, so like probation 183. Um, and then also the diversion slash court cases, 32 are actually actual diversion cases on the diversion, and the, the remainder are um, that I reported that one are pending court process. I just want to clarify that first. Um, never. Thank, you. Thank you. Do we have a racial um, breakdown of, of um, the youth who are incarcerated right now? Yes. Thank you. 27 Hispanic, one Middle Eastern two Polynesian, one African-American, two white, one other, and one Asian. Thank you. All right. Um, welcome, Paul Bocanegra. Commissioner Bocanegra has just um, entered into the room. And Paul, we were just going over the probation report out. And uh, does anybody else have any uh, questions for probation? Yes, Commissioner. Um, hi, good evening. Thank you for being here. I'm just very interested in the diversion programs, and you mentioned that this uh, in February there are 32 actual diversion cases. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the type of diversion? Sure. That you um, so for the Seminole County residents, we have a variety of um, diversion opportunities, uh, such as we could give them a letter of reprimand. Um, we have the petty theft program to offer them. Um, Let's see, typically with that, like properties recovered, um, I believe it's an online class. We have the victim impact awareness program. Um, and we also could offer a 90 day or six month contract. So there's a variety of um, options for diversion. And, and the 60 to 90 day contract, what does that actually entail? Uh, it's 90 day or six month contract. Oh, sorry, 90 yeah, days. Okay. Okay. Um, it's typically a collaboration between the HRS and HSA, um, and then we assess their use needs, um, and they go from there. Um, their community worker, um, they have contact with the school and the home. Uh, we can make referrals to community-based um, organizations. Thank you. Um, for social activities that we might want to get the youth involved with or they have interest in, we definitely will entertain that. Um, uh, if deemed necessary, a social worker would be involved. Um, and let's see. They're, yeah, typically they they need they can't pick up a new case within that time period. Um, and let's see. 
And if they did the original offense and if this new offense went forward, it would go to the DA's office for filings. So we're trying to avoid that with the youth. Right. I'm going to help them. So successful diversion hearing will usually closed and records are sealed as well. Thank you. Um, like I said, unsuccessful matters are referred to the DA. So okay. Generally just trying to help them. Yeah. And may I ask what what is the qualification for the diversion program? Is it like misdemeanors or I mean is there a specific qualification for them to enter to be eligible for diversion? Yeah, there has to be eligibility criteria. Um, I didn't so I didn't bring everything here no worries. today to go over um, certain infractions. Um but, um certain violations can be referred to traffic, um, but um, that's pretty much the information I have for you today. Okay. So I'm guessing just from this, it'd be like petty theft, because it's the petty theft program would be one, and then a traffic in, um, infractions right. would be another. Okay. Um. All right. Well, um, thank you for that. Um, Johanna, I'm yes. Just, you yes. I'm not sure to what extent you can answer this now, but I'm curious as to what elements of the diversion program you might assign to a specific young person? Like, what, what do you mean? Uh, like, do all of them receive a letter of reprimand? No. Um, so how's the base? Yeah, it just depends on like the what being alleged and, and what's in the police report and uh, um, so yeah, yeah, case by case, each individual. So I'm not sure. I have a few questions. Uh, so one of my questions are. Um, Regarding visiting, some of the uh, youth families have raised concerns in the communities that youth are now visiting the glass. And I'm wondering if that is a, a change in policy. Are you asking me? Uh, no, he's talking. Oh. Uh, or um, like, can they expect it to return to normal? So everything is vetted through a case by case basis, right. and the decision is made based on our current policies and how we proceed with who we allow to come in and visit, right. how many people are allowed, what the relationship is with the child. There's a lot of factors that are taken into consideration, but the visiting protocols were recently updated right. based on the changes that have been put forth because we have an influx of people coming in. So we have to maintain the integrity of the institution by following certain protocols, by vetting the people that are coming in and making sure that it's not a safety issue or it's not a confidentiality issue. There's many factors that are taken into consideration when we talk about this. Yeah, is, so that's a preliminary uh, policy or is that a, a policy that, like how long can that go for if say, you know, a family says, hey, you know, Paul, you know, his sister, he hasn't touched his sister in two years and he's been there at the juvenile hall. And, um, you know, he would like to be able to hold his sister. Again, it's all case by case. It's all case, it's all case by case. Okay. Yeah. There's so, many factors that we take into yeah. consideration. Yeah. And the reason I was asking is because, uh, you know, in maximum security prisons where the people are convicted already from murders, different types of crimes. They're having family visits where their families are able to spend the night for three nights now. And I'm just wondering why San Mateo County would be, would have a policy where you go visit the night that that group, you know, is it a threat or they, you know, I'm just trying to figure that out. It's extreme. That's I also think that it's um, relevant to the space, right? Yeah. If they have a private area where they can host a whole family, and they are in private, then it's a different situation than when it's a public visiting room where other people are present. So, so there are many factors, like I said, that we take into consideration. Makes sense. So how do we get a copy of the new visiting policies? So we're aware of it, because when parents yeah, call and say, we now have to visit, or, or there's people who have to visit behind glass. All the families have access to it, and they're posted. Okay. Where are they posted? In uh, the visiting area, I believe, and by reception, I believe that they have those protocols. And the new policy, the families all have received them as well. Thank okay, you. so how does how does the commission receive a copy of these visiting policies? How do how do we know, how do we get a copy? Of them? I can get back to you on that. I, I'm, and I believe I, that if you have specific questions or um requests that you are supposed to go through the shop proposal for those requests yeah actually um we're going to be that's an agenda item today so we're actually going to be discussing that so um so we would just like to see a copy of what those are so we have an understanding of what they are too um okay did you have a question Steve? are you going to ask my question okay i have a question 
Um, yes. Like, how much notice do parents get? Like, I mean, I've visited, before you visit an inmate, we should be able to understand the policy, not just walk up to the door and then, like, be turned away. No, 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 no. So when they have to call, right? You know, they have to call the probation officer in order to request. Oh, right. The probation officer at that point is supposed to relate the information to the family. Right. So the, the family never just show up. Okay. Okay. They that's have, that's yeah. that's the process I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. So it initiates with the probation, probation officer. officer. The probation officer submit does the vetting of right. the individuals. Okay. And then once they have approved it yeah. to come to me, then that's mm -hmm. when I get the final. So how long is the vetting process? Like it, depending on it depends. Who that person is. Yeah, and it depends on how long the flex process takes. There's there are different things that right. need to happen right. before we can help with it. So, so so is the the visiting through glass temporary or is that permanent? So if we have kids who'll be there, let's say maybe three, five years, will they always have to visit with those people behind glass? Or is this in, just until this process can be until the person could be vetted like i said case by case i cannot say yes or no because it depends on who the person is that's coming to the visit so they're doing like background checks yes. and all of that that's um uh, and then i have another question like, is there a way we can all just like bypass that like can we just get a bike can i get the background check so that i don't have to go through that process you like if I want to go see, you know, my cousin, right? And I'm a commissioner. Should I? Shouldn't I already like be on a list that already has been vetted? You. All commissioners have gone through a background check. Oh, okay. yeah, but that background check is separate from our background. Yeah. So even like for for school employees, we still have to conduct an individual background check on our end, even though they have been vetted by the school. Then I had another question, I'm not sure. No, go ahead, Paul. I'm just kind of like changing the, the subject here. Uh, I've sat in on a couple of um, public hearings and have learned that um, this fights are now VA referrals possible. You know, they're being charged with felonies. Uh, so as a survivor of the school to prison pipeline, sometimes that school to prison pipeline looks a little different. And uh, a fist fight uh, becoming a felony and like taxpayers' money being charged for every fist fight, I'm just wondering if there is a policy on what type of fights have to come with the DA referral or is there a, a check the box that we've heard in the past from our DA that if there's a fight immediately, there's a DA referral. Uh, so I'm trying to understand with now walking kids over to the county jail and trying them as, as adults because they turned 18 at a hospital to that happens very frequently in that type of environment. I'm wondering if there's a policy not to charge every kid with a DA referral for every type of physical contact experience that happens with. Uh, first of all, I can't speak to if the policy has changed, yeah. and I can't speak to what the VA is filing, but what I can say is that I, it has not changed since I've been. And that is DA referral for any altercation? No. That's not okay. Accurate. And then um, anybody else have a question before I go? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, my last question is, um, I understand, did the um, kids just participate in the um, Arts Commission Poetry Contest? Did they just participate in that? Um, there's an annual poetry contest. I heard that they just participated in one. Is that correct? Or is that upcoming? Or? Um, I believe it passed a few months ago. Oh, okay. Well, we hadn't heard about it. So I was just, is there anything else that might be coming up that we'd be interested in knowing about? Not that I know at this time. Okay. All right. Do we want to call for public comment on that? Sure. Thank you. Uh, members of the public, if you wish to comment on um, uh, provisions uh, update, item uh, 3C, please raise your hand now in Zoom. Okay. No hands are raised. So back to you. All right. Thank you. Do I see anybody from BHRS? I just see one hand raised from Ornish, Sean. Oh, great. She is from BHRS. Okay. 
Thank you so much for being here, Anit. Welcome. I mean, I'm giving you the permission to talk now, so please proceed. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I just want to introduce myself. I'm the current uh, work out of class uh, unit supervisor for uh, youth services, BHRS team. This is my first time attending, so thank you for having me. I don't have too much to report today. Okay, well, we're very happy to have you and uh, we welcome you in this space and we look forward to you being here going forward. Thank you. Do we need to call for public comment on this? <laughs> <laughs> we'll still do, okay. uh, do it, yes. Any public comment for uh, BHRS? Okay, no hands are raised. Okay, and I do not see anyone from County Office of Education and I do not see John Fong present. Um, I also do not see Supervisor David Canafa. So we will go ahead and move forward with our presentation of Project Cornerstone. And then if Supervisor Canafa jumps on, we can we right. can uh, bring him on. That's Take right. Me. My colleague Sherry did uh, uh, send a message to her his staff. So oh, we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, so our presenter is on Zoom. And I believe, let's make sure she's already been promoted to panelist uh her this right here could if we could promote her and give her Zing. sharing instructions sure. uh Zayim, i'm going to promote you to be a panelist so please accept i don't see her on she, she's on oh uh, okay megan. all right and we also need to um promote megan striker as well thank you so much sure. appreciate it no problem all right, so Megan's going to go ahead and introduce Zeem, and I'm very excited about the, the upcoming presentation. It's called Project Cornerstone, and it's beautiful. So welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Except, can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Well, thank you all for letting me have a couple moments with you this evening to introduce Zeem Newbert. I came to Project Cornerstone as a parent volunteer when Project Cornerstone was um, brought to my son's elementary school for social and emotional learning back in 2022. And I'm also a high school teacher as a profession. And I was very impressed with Project Cornerstone. Their lessons were very straightforward. Their um, information was incredibly well thought out and their staff was very responsive. And the students that we presented the information to and the lessons to on a monthly basis, they responded great to, to the information. They loved the role playing um, activities that were presented. And so much so that Fox School, where my son is at, asked Project Cornerstone to, to come back uh, the, this following year. And the teachers and the parents thought that it was a really worthwhile um, exercise. And so I thought that these techniques and these skills of social and emotional learning are so important for all young people, not just some in a very you know, smaller school. So I thought perhaps to talk to the director of Project Cornerstone and see if we could do a type of collaboration to bring those lessons to more youth um, on everyone in our community, even adults and, and as parents as well, to, to learn these skills too, um, to help our youth. So um, we had a discussion and we're, I'm so lucky and I think we're very fortunate to just have some another conversation with Zim Newbert, who is the director of Project Cornerstone for the YMCA of Silicon Valley. She's also a teacher and educator herself and a parent. So I'll go ahead and introduce her <laughs> and let her take it from here. Welcome. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, do I have access to share screen? Yes, yes, you do. Okay, great. And let's make sure I share the right screen. There we go. Give me one second. Everything was tested before and of course, Never know here. Okay. And the beauty of having two screens is great when it works. Okay. 
Do you see my, so, um, do you see it now? Yes. Sure. And you yes. see the actual That's slide. Great. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And thank you for that lovely uh, introduction, Megan. And I actually, just to give you a little context to, I, I'm a teacher at heart, I used to teach first grade mostly and a little bit second, third and fourth. And then I actually became um, a district coordinator and then a vice principal did a lot of disciplining. And I wish I knew this back then, the project cornerstone model and developmental assets. I think I would have been a more effective um, vice principal because all day long was just suspensions. And I wish I had a different mindset back then. And then I became a principal um, for about three years before I stayed home with my kids and then switched careers here. All right. I'm going to just not make too many slides. Just give you an overview. And then I want to open it up to um, questions and answers would be great. So we are actually part of the YMCA. Um, people see this logo, but sometimes they forget and they don't make the connection. We're part of the um, YMCA of Silicon Valley. So we, our service area is technically Redwood City down to Gilroy, but we do have partners outside of that, um, that area. Um, and we work mostly with school and community partners. Uh, we partner with the Santa Clara County Office of Education through different projects. But the two bottom parts, I think, is most important. That's our foundation. We use the Castle Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning model. They have um, all the SEL social and emotional learning domains in there. And they're very much aligned with developmental assets and developmental relationships, which are two frameworks by Search Institute, which is a research-based um, organization in Minneapolis. And you'll learn more about it. I'm going to show you a quick video that says it perfectly, and I'll talk in more details after I show the video. Let's, um, should it be right here? Oh, and I'm going to make sure that I can share sound. Okay, it should be clicking on just a second. And the slideshow there for a second. Let me see if you can hear the sound because it should have been activated before, but I want to make sure that if it doesn't, um, please let me know and I can make sure that it's working. I know you see the screen. There's the shift sound. Okay, here we go. Stop me if you don't hear anything, please. The YMCA is a place where people can come together, connect with one another, be inspired, and reimagine what is possible for themselves and their community. For young people in particular, we are committed to creating safe and welcoming spaces where they feel recognized and valued. Since 1999, YMCA Project Cornerstone has been recognized as a unique and treasured aspect of the YMCA of Silicon Valley. Is it loud enough for you? Yes. Yes. Okay, and I don't want to waste your time if you can't hear it. It sounds very soft. The YMCA was part of a group called the Youth Alliance, which was made made up of the predominant youth serving traditional agencies in our community. And our job was to make sure people understood that prevention really mattered with kids. Early leaders and initiators had decided they wanted to do some, something big in Santa Clara County that would shift the paradigm away from always looking at what's wrong with kids and how to fix it to what's right. And they all got so excited about the developmental assets framework. And it was such an exciting framework where everyone, everyone could do something to make kids' lives better. When I worked for the city of Morgan Hill, I had the pleasure of working with Project Cornerstone on really building the asset movements in that community. And so when I moved to Watsonville, um, I knew that I really wanted to build the asset movements in, in our community. And the first partner that I thought of was Project Cornerstone. Project Cornerstone has always focused on the whole child, giving them skills, positive relationships and experiences and tools so they can navigate the complexities of their lives. But I think what's unique about us is we engage the whole village, the teachers, the staff, the parents, community members, to show up to build positive relationships and connections for every child. You know, Project Cornerstone, I see in some ways as a pioneer 
in the concept of addressing that whole child, whole family philosophy in concept in school districts. The whole child needs to be now at the forefront of what we do in schools and districts. Project Cornerstone has been really fundamental in helping us develop strategic steps to align all of our organizations around the asset model. Being a caring adult role model in many ways is something that I think more of us need to learn, and I've learned that myself by being a part of Project Cornerstone. I've become a better parent, I've become a better community member, and I think it's, it's really just understanding what we need to do to develop those healthy relationships and empower youth with those developmental assets that they need to become thriving young adults themselves. Hi, my name is Max. I'm in sixth grade, and I've been in Project Cornerstone since kindergarten. Kids need Project Cornerstone because if they're like dealing through a hard time, and volunteers can help you through those tough times and just really help you that like you might not have that at home. I went to an elementary school and I was bullied because my glasses were so thick that someone like on the playground broke my glasses and my mom was there for me. When I moved schools because of what had happened, she found out about Project Cornerstone through Linda and that was how she got involved. She would come to class and read stories to the entire class and each book had like a different lesson. One of the lessons that I really like that helped me was the bucket filling. So bucket filling is like when you like be kind to someone, then you're putting like joy and happiness into their bucket. I hope that more youth have strong support from their family. And I can't imagine not having, you know, that support system. Five years ago, we were celebrating our 20th anniversary. And if you had told me back then that there'd be this thing called COVID and this global pandemic and everything would be shut down and all our kids would go home and do distance learning and we learned this thing called Zoom, I don't think I would have believed you. And now, five years later, here we are. We've learned so much about the impact that COVID has had on our social and emotional well-being. And kids, and their parents need Project Cornerstone now more than ever. Well, I think the most important impact of Project Cornerstone in Silicon Valley is that it's given everyone a common language and a common framework for building developmental assets into our youth. And I think if we empower more adults with those tools and that framework for building those healthy relationships with youth, we're inevitably going to build stronger schools, more caring environments, more, more caring cities, and, and ultimately a more thriving community for all of us. When we all work together to help our youth thrive, the entire community benefits, and that's the power of Project Cornerstone. I'm so grateful for the founders, the volunteers, and all the people who came before me who paved the way and had the vision and heart to create and sustain Project Cornerstone over the last 25 years. Thank you to everyone for all the things you do to help every young person feel supported and be the very best version of themselves. Thank you so much, each one of you, for being a part of our village. And here's to the next 25 years. Happy birthday, Project Cornerstone. So I share that with you because we that was just released a few weeks ago at our breakfast. Um, it is our 25th year anniversary, but it was a very, uh, it's a nice way to me just to be talking at you. It really gives you the picture of how we started, what we're about. And I think the key messages for me, and why I'm excited when Megan reached out to me is that it really does take a village and we don't just focus, even though our um, mission has always been serving kids and empowering them and making, uh, creating safe places where they feel like a sense of belonging, it really needs to involve all key stakeholders. And I'll talk a, a little bit about that when we do the Q&A, but let me um, continue with the slides and I'll go a little bit deeper of what exactly that we do or what we offer, okay. Okay, one second. Okay. 
And while you're doing that, um, uh, Commissioner Slope is uh, now uh, in this meeting. Thank you. Okay. And you're seeing my slide, right? Okay. Yes. Yes. What happens is I have these monitors and my mouse is not cooperating here. There we go. Okay. And so the we already talked, I won't go um, repeat everything that was on there, but the developmental assets framework is what uh, we use as our as our foundation. And when those founders said, this is a great, amazing framework, what do we do with it? And out came the birth of Project Cornerstone. So everything I present to you tonight programs and services, we use this model. We did not create the models. We are not research scientists, but the Search Institute has surveyed over 6 million kids over the last two and a half decades. Santa Clara County is actually uh, a big chunk of their data. We have administered this survey anonymously to students um, in four different batches, 1999, 2004, 2010 and 2016. We were supposed to do it again around 2021, but we all know what happened. We weren't gonna do any surveys during the middle of COVID. Um, but they asked all these questions around developmental assets for kids fourth through 12th grade. And the data is so astounding and that we decided that we're, all, we're gonna use this framework to build and create all of our programs. Developmental assets, the definition is that the positive values, relationships, and experiences that all kids need to thrive. And Search created 40 assets. We added one more with Search's permission. We can't change the data or ask more questions in this survey, but we're very intentional about asset 41, which is positive cultural identity. Can I, as a youth, accept myself, even if I'm different from you, whether it's faith, religion, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, body size, things like that. So we're very um, aware and intentional when we pick books, when we invite uh, guest speakers, when we do some staff development for ourselves as well as for all our volunteers. Okay. And what over the years, um, in the last batch of data we had, it was 2017, we had 43,000 youth, fourth through 12th grade in Santa Clara County who took this survey on in a window of September and October in the same time frame. Um, and what they show is the kids who had more assets of those 40, because number 41 can't be measured, of the 40, the more they had, the better they did. And by better, they asked them also about risk-taking behaviors. For the older ones, they asked the more serious things like depression, suicide attempts, um, uh, drug use, uh, sex, violence, gambling, a whole bunch of stuff. For the younger ones, they add mild, they ask milder versions of that. And then for success, they asked about grades because they know that, you know, grades are important. People, a lot of people feel like, you know, you, you gotta have the grades to show success. Um, we think you gotta have the emotional well-being first before the grades can come. But they asked about the academics, they asked about um, overcoming um, um, obstacles, valuing diversity, helping others, how do you deal with conflict resolution and things like that. So the kids who had more assets had more positive thriving behaviors. And then conversely, the kids who had fewer assets did more of the risk-taking behaviors. That's the, the simplest way to understand the, the data. And that, that's the what and the why. The how is, how do we, if we buy into this and assets are important and we want kids to have more assets, then how do we do this? And their research shows that we're going to create thousands of moments when kids are going to feel valued, respected, and known, which sounds so easy and so common sense. But in all my trainings, people are like, oh yeah, I don't do that. I don't, I know it's important, but I don't do that. So in our trainings of adults, especially for staff, we talk about how do you show up? What kind of, what are, is it the best version of yourself? Are you being a role model, which is one of the assets? Are you making the kids feel like there's, they have a sense of belonging? Because you could be the best mathematician or musician, you have the best lesson plan or the best whatever in your job. And you created this beautiful piece, 
But when the kids come in and they don't feel like you know them, you care about them, and knowing them more than just name on a roster, right? Like what triggers them? What is it? You know, what are what are they? What's their spark? And you don't respect them and the way you talk to them, then you just wasted hours of lesson planning and designing something beautiful because they're there because they have to, but they're not there emotionally, mentally to show up to, you know, soak in all the the, uh, knowledge that you are giving them. And then one of the other assets that we really focus on is asset number three, other adult relationship. And that's why many of our programs bring in um, people other than the parents or other than that primary caretaker, because we know that their research says if you have at least three to five other positive adult relationships, you tend to be more successful. Okay, so whether that's the yard duty person, whether that's the librarian, and whether that if the child, you know, goes to church or has some other, you know, um, faith, and that other person or that coach or Girl Scouts or whomever, and for us, who we train the most are volunteers to come into the classroom or um, to work, you know, out in the yard or whatever, be in a school setting so that can be that other positive relationship. So we engage all stakeholders and by creating our um, services and programs. And you saw this on the video. This is who we work with um, directly. And then our classroom programs, this is what Megan is used to. She got a taste and uh, experienced the, the second bullet, elementary ABC program. Los Dichos is a different program, but very similar. Um, in these programs, we go into the class, that we, we train adults to go into the classroom and work and deliver our lessons. We did not write the books. We found books that had developmental assets built in, but they just don't say assets. Um, it might be about a caring adult. It might talk about uh, integrity or honesty or something like that. And then we created lesson plans and then we train the, the lead people at the school or whatever organization. They go back and train their cohort of volunteers. And then each person is going into a classroom once a month. Once a month-ish, there's about seven or eight books, depending on which version, um, for them to go in and be that consistent person or consistent pair or group of parents that will come in or adults will come in and do the lesson. And the only difference between these preschool uses books, elementary school uses books, Los Dichos is um, bilingual books, same concept, someone comes in and does the lesson, but is um, a person reads in English, a person reads in Spanish, and it was more, the books, some books are the same as the ABC, Asset Building Champions program. Um, we have aligned some of them, but most of the books are around culture, uh, cultural heritage uh, and culture, and it, it opens the door for Spanish speaking parents who might feel like, oh, I can't, I don't speak enough English. So how will I be able to do anything, you know, meaningful in the school? Well, you could read in Spanish and maybe you don't read in Spanish or English, but our uh, lessons always have discussion questions or always have activities that follow the lesson. So you can participate in the activity and lead them in some kind of, you know, arts and crafts or some other or skits or role play or something like that. And then the middle school SEL, social emotional learning curriculum, same concept, we train somebody, they go into the classroom, but we're very aware that no middle schooler wants their parent to come in and read them a book out loud. <laughs> so we created um, Google slides, like modules, we call them, and they are short, they're interactive. It's, it could be about a 40, 45 minute lesson, depending on, on the teacher. Um, there's always embedded videos, like something relevant, like a TED talk or a clip from a, a popular movie or something that talks about the topics that are relevant to that to um, to this curriculum. And then the last one is Expect Respect, which is a three hour workshop directly done by one of our staff, where it's an anti bullying three hour workshop working with a group of kids that the school selects um, paired up with a school club advisor or faculty person. And at the end of the three hours, my staff person walks them through a lot of team building, um, uh, really real talk about what's going on at their campus. They talk about bullying and then they come up with an action plan at the last hour. What are the things that this group of kids giving them voice and empowering them? What are they want to do and implement and roll out at their school to make their school a more caring place? 
And so my person leaves can do follow up with them, but their club advisor is the one that meets with them on a regular basis to make sure that these things are implemented, led by the kids. Okay. And then the other part of that, you know, the Venn diagram with the three circles there, the parent education is remember the whole village is then we train parents um, on developmental assets, but we use that language and that framework to have single session workshops on things like stress management for your child and for you, how to talk about race, racism and equity for, to your kids, how to talk about current events, um, uh, digital citizenship, managing the whole device and social media stuff. We have one called um, something about the brain development, like what happened to my child in middle school? They're a completely different beast now, you know? So talking about brain development, understanding that. And so different topics we created, especially out of COVID um, because we pivoted of course and went to virtual and now we still do virtual and in-person. And that last bullet is a six week series designed by Search Institute with their workbook that we buy but we have supplemented with our own activities and discussion. It's lovely. It's what it's what turned the light bulb on for me that was like, okay, I actually would like to work for Project Borders Don't, even though I'm, you know, I've just been volunteering. But the the six week series as a parent, developing my parenting skills and improving them, and always learning with a group of people um, was just mind boggling. And you get to uh, develop relationship for six weeks and. And the best thing is you feel like I'm not alone. Like I'm not the only ones with these problems and I'm not the only one who's not a perfect parent, you know? So it's, it's really lovely. And the third part of that um, piece of the circle chart that I showed is staff development. We work with teachers, yard duty. We work with uh, principals for consultation. We work with different organizations and training their staff on not how to do those programs up above, but how to show up in their role, like I said, whether whatever your role is, teacher or whomever. Um, I've trained um, uh, instructional assistants as well, and even bus drivers and you know different uh, stakeholders in the community, and talk about how like how every little thing that you do or don't do, say or don't say, it needs to it it impacts the kids. They see it, whether you think they see it or not. And how you show up really does matter. And you need to be a part of that village to create those thousands of moments for kids. Okay. And this is the last part. It wasn't part of the circle, but I started a group um, recently with high schoolers helping us to do our work and giving them voice and asking them to um, look at our things. And then we do some projects together and giving them voice to make us better. Okay. And then everything that I said in the classroom, these are the things that are in common. They either use books or the modules. They are all using developmental assets or relationships or SEL. They're all aimed to create a positive, safe school climate and culture and to build that common language. Somebody on the video talked about, you know, it's really nice to be in a community where like, oh, we're sharing some of the same language of how to treat each other and then enhancing students' positive cultural identity. And then those school programs I mentioned um, is called train the trainer model, where we train somebody who's a lead, they go back and train others. That's that other caring adult I was talking about. And these are just prettier versions of what I said. So there's the preschool T TK school program, bilingual books, ages three to five. There's the ABC one that Megan got to experience using books. There's a Los Dichos program, like I said, with Spanish and English. There's the middle school curriculum with the modules. There's Expect Respect one, anti-bullying workshop. And then on the left is the parent adult workshop, some of the topics I mentioned, and on the right are some of the staff workshops. Interestingly enough, on the bottom two bullets of the staff workshops, we're customizing all the time. And I don't know if how familiar you, familiar you are, but I worked with one of the districts two years ago, right in the middle of COVID. We're kind of transitioning back a little bit. I did a Zoom workshop for 199 uh, educators. It was their whole, it's a small district, so their whole team. Um, and it was, it was supposed to be on, introduction to, to developmental assets 
And then as we were planning, we decided that, you know what, they're so stressed out. They are unburnt out. They don't know how to take care of themselves. And it's so hard with COVID. How can we bring in these developmental assets, but use the language? And instead of teaching them what to do with the kids, how about we teach them what to do with each other? And so we uh, combine stress management as well as some of the other's tools and strategies and focusing on them so that they can um, can feel valued, respected, and known. Same thing as the kids, but we were focusing on adults. And then the bottom one was another school saying, you know, they're not even taking care, they're not taking care of each other and they're being really mean to each other and the teachers are bullying each other. So can you do something like that? So we added on and, and again, customized to like, how do you expect to serve these kids if you don't take care of yourself? But then if you're not taking care of your village at the school, then you're not going to be as, as effective. So we, we, again, customized and switched some of the activities and applied it to the staff. And um, so that was, that was really cool. And we'll just end on that. This is our little mantra we like to say, um, be who you needed when you were younger. And I believe the quote at the bottom is from Magic Johnson. All kids need is a little help, a little hope, and someone who believes in them. So, Thank you. yeah, if I can, I'm just checking for time. You tell me how much time I have, but I just wanted to give you a little bit, if, if I can, what the group, when we met to plan for this, what we were thinking, and then open it up. But, Someone who's the timekeeper, let me know if that is something you want me to do okay. or just. Oh, why don't we um, why don't we go around and see if anyone has any questions okay. and then we can go into we can decide as a group whether or not we're going to make a motion to explore um, opening up a project to explore this and see how we can bring this into our delinquency prevention work and possibly into our um, our gateway and juvenile hall settings. So mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, uh, Commissioner Hunter. Uh, hi, Tiffany here. Um, thank you for the information. I'm somewhat aware of Dr. Cornerstone. I used to be on YMCA, YMCA board in, in the falls of Roswell. Um, the concern I have is y'all aren't really in the community. I'm aware of Search Institute. I'm aware of what y'all are doing. Um, I mean, even speaking with our wife about our YMCA in this fall zone, um, it's really hard to get into. People, he has a gym. People can't get in there. And so if it's just hard for the community to get access, I, I don't know what our kids are going to do in doing a holiday game. I mean, it would have to be like integrated. Um, so that's my concern. My <laughs> second concern is I don't see enough partnerships that are credible that talk about cultural identity. I run a nonprofit organization that preserves our culture um, and we take up 24% of this county. So I see Latino representation. I don't see Pacific Islands. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and then we could just go down the list with the other buy box. But um, that's those are my concerns. And I don't really know. I didn't understand what the presentation was about of like it presenting to us if we're going to adopt something to integrate it into well, what, the, the what we're what we're doing. But those are just generally, as a community member, genuine concerns. So what we were interested in learning more about this social emotional learning and being that we have this, this charge from the county for delinquency prevention. And, and most of our work is really focused on the kids once they enter the system. And so what we're trying to, a lot of the kids tell me when I talk to them and I'm like, how did you end up in juvenile hall? And they say, Mr. Hunt, it started with bullying. Right, so I'm trying to to find organizations and programs that can address this in the delinquency prevention space right. before they get into into okay. this space. So social emotional learning is a is a um, hot topic right now, yeah. and so I wanted everyone to learn about it and to see how could we incorporate this 
in our spaces. Mm -hmm. So we we definitely need, in my opinion, to branch out our delinquency prevention efforts countywide. Mm -hmm. And so this was something that I wanted to have everybody learn about. And um, Karen, did you have some thoughts on this as well? Uh, well, I was just interested in your perspective, Tiffany, and I, one thing that struck me is the fact that um, you're observing that a Pacific Islander community isn't included. You know, I kind of flip that around and say, what a great opportunity then to, to bring that to the Pacific Islander community. If, if, it's, if it hasn't been included, then that's like, wow, that seems like a good opportunity yes. to do that. Um, and I was just curious about your comment that you couldn't get into YMC and what that meant. YMCA? Yeah. YMCA. Um, I, you know, it's it's been a challenge for families to just either pay for membership, afford membership. It's a sliding fee scale. So there's a lot of right. other so layers that, you know, if you don't have pay, pay, pay stubs and things of that sort, like all of those cumbersome things that prevent families to actually gain access. So it's really tailored towards folks that can really have that privilege. Okay, so that's a good question. And that was kind of one of my questions, which is, uh, it seems to me that these programs are being provided in a school context. Right. Um, yeah. So it wouldn't be provided through YMCA. YMCA is the one that's kind of sponsoring right. it and provides the foundation for it. But it's typically provided in a school context with a, a cohort of students who participate together and kind of then live the I, live the lessons together going forward. Yes. Right? So, yeah, if I can just address, I just let me make sure I... Um, Yes. So Project Cornerstone is an initiative within the YMCA of Silicon Valley. So and I'll just start a higher level there. So our team is actually only 10 people, but we have the infrastructure, the, the privilege of like having HR from the Y and marketing and things like that, right, to help us. Um, so we're not really a startup, right, but we're a small team within the bigger organization. So we don't even, we don't live at any of the branches. We live at the, well, home of a lot of us now, but also at this central headquarters uh, association office. And the way we are funded is we have district, um, school district MOUs, so contracts or memorandum of understanding. So we, we Project Quarters don't contract directly with the schools. So we have a whole bunch of contracts with, you know, throughout um, Santa Clara County and, and beyond. And then we and then we have our campaign, which is separate. And then we have donations, um, well, the campaign donations. And then we have funders. We have um, state and uh, county funders as well as community foundations, right? So it's part of the why, but it, it's like, like if you want me to answer the stuff about getting access to YNCA, I can go talk to somebody and see how, you know, if they can uh, collaborate on that to make that easier. Cause I don't even know the funding structure or the sliding scale off the top of my head for membership. Uh, Cause for us, for our team, our membership are our clients, which are the school partners, right? So um, that's one way. So whatever it is, it won't be an access through the Y as Karen was saying. The other part is yes, we are very aware that our um, a lot of our materials and even like the parenting workshops, we deliver them in English or Spanish or Vietnamese, and that's only because of that was that's the main demand the request we get in the county office of you know in Santa Clara County. We have to say, and I agree with you, like um, we did have a partnership at MOU with the um, primary school, right in East Palo Alto. That's by Priscilla Chan. And when they first started, starting from preschool, we were one of the first ones where they actually hired and I trained them and they, they did our preschool program. But over the years, they lost their main lead person, um, a strong parent who was kind of in charge of training the other one. Remember the train the trainer program? And I believe they went somewhere else were no longer there or were not leading the program. But one of the things I know that was like, they love the books, the bilingual books there. But again, it wasn't, they didn't see Pacific Islander um, representation in those, in those books. So we haven't been, you know, and so we're not, we have never like switched to say, well, should we get books now that are more like going to Cupertino and do more Mandarin and Chinese culture and go here and do the Indian culture and go here and try to, you know, fit every, every, um, the needs. I'm not saying the needs aren't there, 
Um, so I do see that as, you know, a growth opportunity. I'm not saying that we're, you know, going to switch to one group or another, but I, I do understand that it's not all inclusive. But the language, the common language we're talking about is that's all inclusive is being kind and showing up and having empathy and having skills to navigate, you know, against bullying or sticking up for yourself and also sticking up for other people. And those going to that approach, regardless of where you're coming from. Um, and then the other part, I do want to say this, which is really important. It might help with other questions is we are a preventative. Uh, we, our philosophy is we are in a prevention business, right? We want to help and to do things up front so that kids don't get to a certain state. But although we think that all kids, and I think all adults would could use a dose of developmental assets, but we are not in the business of, you know, let's, like it wouldn't have been my first thing, let's go to, you know, the juvenile hall and see how we can deliver this. But when it was presented to me, I'm like, you know what? All kids need it, but I do want to say this. I do know enough. I don't know everything about what you guys are doing at all. And I, I feel very um, humbled, like just like trying to figure out what you know you guys all do. But we, I know that we can't just take our program as is and let's say go into the juvenile hall system and say, hey, let me show up and teach your kids this and read them a book or tell them how to be kind and be an upstander and have empathy because it's got, it's got to have trust, you know, we got to have, it takes time. And I don't know how many, and I'm making assumptions here. So I'm really sorry if I'm doing too much generalization. I don't know how their support system is in their family. How many other caring adults do they have in their lives? What's going on when they get out of the system and they come back home? I don't know. Um, I just don't see me coming in and working with kids or any of my staff are going to be like, okay, like they're going to be like, who are you? And why, what are you telling me what to do? So I was telling in the planning, I was thinking, you know, what if, if we were to go through with this, I think we should step back, talk to the adults who are working with the kids is one, one thing of engaging stakeholders. Who are the people showing up and doing whatever they are, need to do for these kids? Do they need to be reminded or just learn about this model, whether they use our program or not, about how to show up and help kids feel like they belong, regardless of eight, whatever mistakes or whatever their circumstances, whatever it is that they, you know, landed them in this, in this situation. And then, and then if we could get together and go, okay, what are your goals as the adult in these kids' lives? What do you want them to, what's success to you? What is what are your goals that you want, you know, for the kids to in the time that they're with you in whatever situation? What's the outcome? And does Project Cornerstone, any of our existing programs, or we customize some programs, or any of our talks, is it, you know, which flavor, if any, or combination would you feel like it might be helpful for us to come in and deliver something or train adults to deliver something for the kids? And for me, what's exciting is like, maybe it's just having a, a safe space over time, having conversation where the kids can even look at some of the, these assets and say, yeah, I have this, I don't, I get it. Or, you know, one of the things I shared the other day was, did you know that the research, that the data shows that the asset number, I don't know if it's eight, number eight or nine, I don't have the brochure in front of me, is called Community Values Youth. And they asked kids, do you, as an uh, adolescent or a child, feel like the adults in your community value who you are, value what, you, you know. And I believe it was 20 something percent for elementary. And by the time they get to high school, it was 17% of the kids, the way they answered the multiple questions show that they had that asset. So if you take 100 minus 17, what is that? 83% of the kids in high school at that time felt like, adults don't value me. That still gives me like shivers when I think of that. It means like 87% when I go see kids in high school, they don't feel 87% of them don't feel like I value them. And then when I reflect about myself, I'm a really caring person and I'm an educator and all that, right? I could see 
what I have done in the past before I took my the parenting class. I'm like, I could see my attitude, how a teenager walking by me could feel like I don't value them. Right. So anyway, that's just my own personal thing. But I'm just thinking, like, if we were to do something, if the person who asked, what what is this about? I'm not trying to sell you anything. I have plenty of work to do, <laughs> but I, this is an exciting opportunity. I'm open if you were to move forward. It would be a lot of consultation, collaboration, and I don't think it's like a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, I'm gonna take this and this and apply it right away. Maybe there's one of those flavors that might, especially for your preventative program, but for the other pro the, the other group of kids, I feel like it would have to be a lot of work on the adult side to have something pretty well polished and good before we try it on because I don't feel like those kids should be experimented on. Yeah. Do, so does anyone I'm, else have any I'm, questions? I'm, I'm, yes. So I think we should extract some of this uh, emotional learning curriculum. The problem I have with curriculums is because I, she just read the, the, the number of students that are in probation. They're all BIPOC. Mm -hmm. The problem is these curriculums are based on indigenous knowledge, indigenous like practices that these, these kids are going to go back into these homes. So yes, it's a very general curriculum and it can be tailored to any culture, but if it's me, if it's Eugene, or if it's Paul, or if it's Genevieve here that's delivering it that looks like the students and can relate to them, you can train me and I'll take it. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I see the approach in this partnership working with Cornerstone. I, I don't I don't feel like they're the experts and they should be able to mastermind this. I think that in in collaboration, in partnerships with the experts, with the people that are serving our families and our students, we can come to a harmonized, harmonized curriculum that can better serve the students so that they can get on with their lives and drive. I, I believe in social emotional learning. It's not that I don't. It's just sometimes the delivery in these, in these mechanisms, they don't resonate with our students. They're just and you're, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You hit it right on the nail. And that's why a lot, the train the trainer, right? Like we don't go in there themselves. And that's why I was hesitant. Like if you bring me into a Vietnamese and I'm I'm a first generation Vietnamese. If you bring me to a Vietnamese uh community even I would be I might be accepted because I might look the part but my generation and my lack of fluency in my language and the way I grew up I'm gonna stick out right but I do know that I have been in situations where like they're like at least she's Vietnamese you know and she's trying to speak Vietnamese and she doesn't have all I can't and it doesn't matter even if I'm fluent I can't represent every Vietnamese person in the world right it's my own story, but you're right. There's credibility of like where I'm coming from. Do I understand? I am BIPOC, but I, do I pretend to understand every culture that fits under BIPOC or every ethnicity? No, right? And every and even within that, there's not like, you know, nobody can represent everybody, but I totally get it. Like, there's, I don't think that's why I'm like, I don't want to go in there myself but if there was something for training, maybe like some of the adults, but then training the adults to use whatever program we land on or whatever services, I think it would go way, way farther, further if somebody who looks like the kids who can talk the language and have some experiences. And one of the things, um, like I mentioned, I, I believe um, whoever was on the call the other day, I said, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry to have to cut. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. We are. We Time. And so I just wanted to um, see if if there was a motion that we could put together to explore the social emotional learning and how we might be able to explore Project Cornerstone in our delinquency prevention efforts, if anyone was interested in a motion. To... I, I would make a motion. I just want to make one, yes, one yeah. comment prior to making the motion, which is I really what resonated to me was a comment um, about needing to understand the support system that youth have at home and otherwise in their lives. And that's something that I think I've heard from Jane and Paul and Tiffany and you know others in the community that you can do a lot for kids in the youth services center or within any other program, and then they go home mm -hmm. and they go back to their neighborhood, and that's such a fundamental part of you know shifting that the support system where they live, mm -hmm. what they're going back to, and if there's something that we can do 
that integrates that with the people that can speak to what those pressures yeah. and supports are. I think that would be really valuable. So all that being said, uh, I had one, yes, one yes. point that we can investigate, yes. but just before we say we want to go forward with a motion on this, Zine, is it you're you're I'm I'm gathering that you would be open to doing work in San Mateo County. That would be something mm -hmm. that you could yeah, yeah. In fact, today I was just, we're about to submit a grant due on Friday. Hopefully we get, if, and that is part of um, a plan to expand and to go throughout California. Okay. So it's okay. like the wrong timing actually. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was making a motion then for um, the commission to uh, set, set a, a, a committee together to liaise with Megan and Zine and explore some of the specific concerns and opportunities in our delinquency prevention efforts to apply the principles of Project Cornerstone and to, I'm, I'm rambling here now, but um, you got that Suki? <laughs> we, have on, we have it on video um yeah so so basically what we would want to do i think in, in what we do with any project is to bring together a smaller group of people who are interested in you know kind of wrestling with some of the questions that have come up today i, I think there's a lot of potential here for our yes. community but we need to dig down a bit and yes and have more of an opportunity to ask the questions and work together with megan and zine small group to explore opportunities to apply the principles of Project Cornerstone within our community. Yes, do I have a second? I have a comment, and then I will second that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, or an ask, uh, thank you so much for taking the time Yes, today. we really appreciate it. Really explain, elaborate uh, all of the compartments of your program, uh, Project Cornerstone. Uh, I think what I heard today was that uh, some of our you know, BIPOC brothers and sisters feel like the underserved community has been locked out of your YMCA's and our communities. And I, and I heard you mention earlier that, you know, you're just one of 10, you're, you're 10, a term, a 10 person team, small program in a huge organization. Uh, but you did say that you would take that to management and, and share the sentiments of some of the commissioners uh, that that shared their how they felt uh, in their communities in viewing YMCA, and also I'd like to ask if if there's some incentive, right? Like uh, we want to open our doors to you, so you can access our youth with your program. Would you be willing, in turn, to lobby management to open your doors in our neighborhoods where we're raised, where we feel locked out, maybe as an incentive? for completing your programs, maybe throughout the youth. Again, it's just an idea, but that's just what I heard. And I wanted to advocate uh, for my brothers and sisters who feel locked out, that if you can just take that to management and hopefully we can come to some kind of understanding where if you graduate your program, uh, if, if we could access your institutions or your buildings in our communities. Yeah. I I would ask this though, I would be happy more, and I commit to doing that. I just want to ask this though. Um, I want to make sure I don't mess up the message <laughs> or like, you know, if you, if somebody wouldn't mind like writing down exactly what you mean by locked out and someone giving examples, then that would be, it, it would give me more information to give it to the right person. I actually do know who the right person is. She's probably, yeah, I think it would be my, my immediate supervisor, my COO, but I don't want to like be the wrong, yes. de deliver the wrong message. I want to be more specific. Whatever you said, you you said it very elegantly, but I just want to make sure if you can just write it down for me that I can get the message, plain telephone, you know, I don't want to mess it up. Thank you. Um, so, that as an action point, Yes, yes. To follow up on that specifically, quite apart from this project. Move the slide yeah. okay. I, think, I think we need to discuss a little bit too um, how YMC works with these organizations who aren't really part of YMCA, but yeah. are funded through YMCA. They're almost like sponsored by YMCA, but they're not really YMCA. So oh, I just actually, Karen, I want to, I, I might've misled you. So we are part of YMCA, even okay. though we're a small initiative. We're like, we like, when I write this grant, 
I have to use the YMCA of Silicon Valley as the, the organization. So we're not just like a contractor separate. Not, we're, so but we're more than the fiscal. Yeah, we're part of the whole, like the yeah. budget and everything. The big budget is the YMCA budget. So we are part of, and like my staff, my paycheck, my whatever is all YMCA. Yes. Okay. So we unfortunately are yeah. really out of time. So do we need to take a vote to see whether or not we want to just explore a subcommittee sure. to explore social emotional learning and how we might be able to bring so um, project cornerstone and, and that and would be working with Megan and and Nina. whomever else is interested. Right. And we can figure that out afterwards. Okay. okay. All right. Do we want to do do we have to do roll call, Susan? We need a second for the motion. Oh, sorry, two things. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um First of all, take public comment. Oh, yes. Okay. yes. And then second thing is um, the way it's listed on the agenda, yes. it's, it's presentation. Oh, only. So, no vote. So it doesn't say motion or okay. an uh, action okay. you know, vote. So I think maybe you can provide direction that maybe at the next meeting we'll bring an okay, action okay. item. Excellent. Right? And then you guys can you know draft something up, right? And then put as a you know action item Perfect. on the agenda. And then okay. thank you for that. Yeah, sure. Zim, if you could um send it to the uh, uh, chair and then we can forward that over to the other commissions. Commission I didn't hear what you said. Just send the, the my slides and then we can forward that over to the other commissions. Yes, yes. Okay. If you could send it to uh, Chair Rasmussen and then uh, we awesome. can forward it to the other commissioner. So, okay. uh, thank you so much, Tim. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Okay, so, so now we do public comments. Yes, we'll do public comments. And then maybe at the next meeting, you guys. And then we're not rushing and we can do right. it properly. Okay. Exactly. You know, Perfect. maybe curate an ad hoc committee or yes. do another action item. Thank you so much. Yep. So, uh, members of the public, uh, if you wish to comment on uh, item five regarding this uh, presentation on Project Cornerstone, uh, please do raise your hand in Zoom now. I don't see any hands raised. And well, thank you so much to Megan and to Zim. We really appreciate your time and your presentation, and we look forward to collaborating. Thank you very you. much. Thank you. For the record, yeah. could you um, uh, withdraw your motion? Oh. I withdraw my motion. And I withdraw my motion. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Wow, All you're right. <laughs> All right, so now we are on to. Uh, our next item on the agenda, which is the communication protocol. Um, and a copy of that is in the agenda packet. Now, I want to give a little bit of a background before I open this up for discussion. Good luck on the uh, plane. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Thank you. So, <laughs> Thank you, Megan. So, um, I, um, there's been a lot of movement in probation. We've got a lot of new folks, and there's been a lot of movement in the commission. And so when I uh, sent out an email welcoming Nora uh, to the commission and kind of what we do here and what's reported out and sort of welcoming her and sort of explaining that, um, I got an email back from Ms. Clark advising me that we had a communication protocol in place that, that I hadn't heard about. So then when I reached out again to probation to ask whether, uh, just to give a heads up that we're gonna be doing follow-up items this month and what they were gonna be in so they would be prepared I was again told that I was not conforming to this communication protocol. So I had never heard of such a thing. And so I was told that Monroe entered into this agreement. And so I wanted to bring it here because whenever the commission enters in an agreement, we do it as a body and it has to be presented. And, and that's kind of the process for the way that um, we do things. I did receive the email thread that I shared with each of the commissioners um, that was between uh, Chief Keene and Monroe that discussed some criteria for how to communicate, but the thread ended with, I'm gonna check with my folks and get back to you and there was no meeting of the minds. So I wanted to bring this forward um, because it is it changes the way we conduct business, that who we communicate and how we communicate. So one, I wanna make sure everyone's aware that this was being discussed and um, get your input. And what I've done is I've taken the information that Chief Keen outlined in his email to Monroe, and I summarized it, and that's what's included in the packet here, um, to sort of give everyone an idea of, of what probation is proposing. So that's sort of the background on this, and so I'd like to just open it up now for discussion um, to get other commissioners' thoughts and ideas on uh, what they what their thoughts were about this new protocol. 
Well, Who'd like to go first? So, would you like, could you please read the poem? Paul? It's in the packet. Oh. But I'm happy to give you a copy. It, it's kind of long, so give you a lot to read. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I just wanted to add that I think that um, some of the confusion might have arisen. Sorry, some of the confusion might have arisen because we were talking about this. Um, I think it arose specifically in relation to the sexual abuse. Hold on a second, we can't hear what who's talking about. You guys need a copy? Okay. All right, go ahead. Um, um, yeah, I think we were the, the original the original communication about communicating. Um, we had received in the context of the sexual abuse allegation committee investigation. And so, so I think I'm, I believe that we had all interpreted that as being specific to those communications because there was such a range and, and breadth of communications happening at that point that it made sense to streamline it. So and it was so unusual. I apologize that we didn't yeah. realize that that was an ongoing um, protocol that we were meant to put in place. So yeah, I think it is a really good time to uh, look at this and make sure that we're all happy with it and clear with it. From from my perspective, I have no no issue with, and Johanna, thank you for summarizing it so clearly. Um, I guess one question I would have is, you know, as a commission, our role under the uh, Welfare and Institutions Code is to inquire into the administration of juvenile justice in our county. And part of what happens in these meetings when we inquire is we ask questions of, you know, our partners in this space, and it provides a platform for the sharing of information and educating members of the community. And I think also, you know, instilling confidence in members of the community that our administration of justice is robust and um, transparent. Uh, so my only concern, and I think we have a really good kind of granular example to use here in that in the January meeting, we'd had some questions on diversion data and strip search data that came out of the BSCC inspection, which is public information. And, you know, strip search is something that we, of course, are, you know, paying close attention to because of the potential for uh, trauma to youth. And um, so the follow-up, I think there was an opportunity to share that information in this meeting and, you know, present that to the broader community. So if, I think we just need to be clear that you know, we're, we're very happy to respect whatever works best for the probation department and in terms of, you know, streamlining your workflow and, um, you know, providing the information from the person who's best able to extract that information and provide it, you know, no problem with that. But I would hate to lose the opportunity to really kind of showcase the collaboration and the transparency within the community. Um, and also, I mean, these are not the, you know, diversion is a good news story. <laughs> that's a that's a positive. And I was, you know, hopeful to hear more of that and give you the opportunity to kind of shine. Yeah. Um, so I just don't want to lose that. I, I want to be respectful of, of how we can, you know, communicate positively and respectfully. But I also, you know, want to use this platform to examine and you know inquire into the administration of, of justice and do our job within the community. Thank you. Who's who, anybody else like to make comments on? So I have a and number one, I would also like to take this opportunity to advocate for the two incoming commissioners who should also have an opportunity to set eyes on this and um, to to speak their part on this. So hopefully this will be an ongoing uh, conversation, especially when it comes to, if I'm reading this correctly, we have to submit a FOIA if we seek information um, as commissioners regarding policies, data, historical records requests should come in, in a form of a FOIA um, or in respect to the, excuse me, Sorry, oh. tight conversation. Yeah. Um, 
Well, that's a good question. We should. Right. We, I mean, yes. that, I think it's a great opportunity just to clarify how, yes. how we should yeah. do it because we, we want to do the right thing. Because that's concerning. If commissioners have to access information uh, via the vehicle of, of a FOIA, then then what exactly is the role of the commission yeah. in trying to provide transparent oversight and be the mediators between the parents, the community, as well as the probation department? And I and I think that you raised uh, a very critical point here. Uh, we were we we began this conversation uh, after allegations that are still in litigation uh, regarding uh, sexual assaults of our children. And I think that we asked a question some months ago regarding strip searches, and we received an answer that turned out to be uh, not accurate. And so I, I just don't believe that collaboration and transparency uh, is accomplished through a FOIA. Mm -hmm. so, so Commissioner Swope, we're not the general public. We are a group that has been assigned the task of overseeing the implementation of juvenile justice in the county, not only by the county board of supervisors, but also by the courts. So I don't think it's appropriate that we should have to go through the same channels or have the same deadlines uh, or time span to go and get as far that the general public can have. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. No, my, my, my own question has been short lived, but I, I've noticed even just during this time that um, sometimes our communication is easy with probation has been with the wrong person, which led to uh, missing misinformation, miscommunication. And I think that's one of my main concerns when it comes to just this change. Like I understand the request part. It's like if there are certain, certain documents that they have to do the most department so the person. But I think that overall when it comes to information that we actually need, I there is a concern that depending on who we were supposed to reach out that reach out to that we may reach out to the wrong person, wrong department, get wrong uh incorrect information and maybe Cause uh, a delay of response because we you now reach out to the wrong person. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? I see Chief Keen has his hand. Oh, he did yeah. have his hand. No. Oh, oh. Anybody else want to make any? Yeah, I'll yes. just, you know, in looking at this and what everyone else is saying and just overall, um, you know, opening the lines of communication between the probation and the juvenile justice commission, just commissioners are, is fundamental. Um, to promoting collaboration, information sharing, accountability, um, you know, just how do we continuously improve? And accountability is really where this is, this is our job, is to be accountable for something, or in this case, systematic change. I mean, my mom's been on this commission for years, and I'm like, okay, has anything really changed? And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I really want to be here for that reason. And if it's anything else, please tell me now. I, I gotta go. <laughs> I can't. It's just it's a waste of time. So I just want to say that for the general public to hear, probation to hear, everybody to hear is that we have a due diligence. And if things aren't being done right then just call it what it is and we just got to work together so that's all i got to say okay i just wanted to add some just a quick comment before we go to chief keen and maybe uh, your honor might have some something to add here as well uh, my my only concerns here were if i didn't see a space for traditionally for the last 20 some odd years you know it's been you know jihan and melanie and those folks in those spaces and now it's sanam and nora and they've always been the ones to provide that information and eliminating that whole level of management who works directly with the children and families is concerning to me. And I'm also concerned about the public records request because I really want to work as a team. I think we should be working together and it shouldn't be so there shouldn't be obstacles. So I'm going to open it up now. Have, yes, well, go ahead. I, and, and I want to just say with all due respect to our chair who entered into this agreement with our chief, uh, I want to respect that and its totality, uh, but I would just like to say that uh, we have a new chair, we have new leadership uh, who has shared this, and I just uh, 
fear that bottlenecking the flow of communication between the commission and the public and the probation is not the proper response after an agreement between our outgoing chair and our current chief. So with all due respect to our outgoing chair, I think that he made this agreement uh, on behalf of himself and no one here had an opportunity to, to speak their part in this. And um, I just wanted to respectfully lay that out there that you know, I respect Monroe's agreement, uh, but we have new leadership here. And uh, I think that it's important that we uh, respect that she wants to share this responsibility with the rest of the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Keen. So let me provide some context to why this information is in front of you. There is no interest here in any lack of transparency. There's no interest here in bottlenecking communication. The reality here is that what we're trying to accomplish is actually to make sure that we provide you with all the information that you request in an actually a much more streamlined fashion. Because what we were experiencing is that oftentimes there was quite a few emails that were going to multiple people at multiple layers, asking for multiple types of information. And we were not necessarily all in alignment with who was providing what to who when. And it was providing, it was matter of fact, creating a lot of confusion within our own organization as to who was responding to various members of the commission. Now, when we talked to Monroe about this, the email stream that I have Monroe actually says in Monroe's own words that he actually spoke to various members of the commission and sought approval from people from the commission and said they were in agreement. Now, whether that was true or not is obviously cannot be you know, verified at this point. So I wanna say in fairness to Monroe, he actually said that he actually had spoken to various people. So he didn't seem as if he did this in a vacuum. So the reality is there is no intention here to not include people that such as Jahan and Sanam and Nora. The reality is that when someone would say, for example, in this request would reach out to me to say, hey, we want to look for certain you know, information or talk to certain people, I would certainly direct that you know a request to the appropriate people. I have no intention of being the sole provider of the information. I just want to ensure that we are making sure that the right people are involved in the process and we have a way of documenting who is being responsible for what information. This allows us to keep track of what we're providing, who is doing the communication, because that's what's important for us in terms of tracking this. There's not going to be any change in that type of level of communication. It just allows us to track it. You will still get a chance to talk with the people in the facility who do the work on a day-to-day -day basis. That does not change. What is changing is that there will be a way for me and the assistant chief to know when the requests are being made. That is all this does. It does not change anything else other than that. It is an opportunity for us to track the request. That's what this is, nothing more, nothing less. It is a tracking mechanism. So it may make you feel as if there's something that's happening that is going to, you know, uh, somehow bottleneck or something of that nature. And if that's the case, I apologize for making you feel that way, but that's not the intention here. That what it does for me is it creates process. Those of you who have had the opportunity to work with me for a while, you will know that I'm a process person. I am creating process so that I'm able to ensure that within the levels of our organization, we have a better sense of what's happening. That not, you know, someone is not reaching out to someone two or three levels down, asking them for information that frankly, upper management should be aware of and know that who's speaking about things that frankly, they may or may not be in a position to accurately speak to that we at a management level should be speaking to. Whether it is a budgetary question, it could be a philosophical question, or it could be a higher up question with regard to something that we're doing that could be re related to litigation. It could be related to something that is maybe something that's coming directly from the county manager's office or the county attorney's office. 
So those are bits of information that, frankly, as the chief, I need to be aware of. So that's the purpose for this request. So that was the purpose. Chief, I, 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 that was, I want to finish. I would like to finish, please. That was the purpose for me asking Moreau for that, you know, this kind of opportunity. The way it's kind of written in this kind of, you know, paragraph form, I know it looks very daunting, but I sent it to him in an informal email. I didn't put it in this kind of format. So once again, I certainly did not mean for it to kind of turn into this, you know, um, very kind of uh, aggressive or somehow kind of, um, you know, off-putting kind of process because that was not the case. It was a very informal request made to Monroe to streamline communication so we could have a better sense of what was being asked of by who so we could better track it inside of our organization. So thank you for explaining that. I appreciate you being here to explain that because um, I, I actually did reach out to Monroe and, and he, he told me that he didn't enter into the agreement, but that he was where he left it off on the email thread. And I provided the email thread to the rest of the commissioners. So they had the background was that he was going to get back to you on it. And so there was no formal agreement. And so I wasn't in that conversation. I only could read the emails. And so I'm just doing what I need to do to bring this to my fellow commissioners um, because it's been a problem when I went to request even today when I prior to your arrival when I said how do we get a copy of the new visiting policy I was referred to Michelle Kozel and we've been operating this way I think Susan Commissioner Swope's been on the commission almost 20 years how many years 12 12, 12 years okay 12 and um, we've always up until the sexual abuse prevention subcommittee was formed <clears throat> communication has been um pretty easy and uh, and worked well and so i have um when uh your when the probation department requested that we meet quarterly to review information that was coming up so we didn't have all the information to show up in an inspection report they requested that we meet more regularly when i reached out to schedule that meeting um, I was told it needed to go to Michelle Kozel when I was reaching out to the people who were in the room who made the request to me. So not knowing about this protocol made it very difficult for me Ms. to Rasmussen, do what I needed. Ms. Rasmussen, yeah. would you like for me to share my screen to share the email thread for everyone? Sure. sure. I didn't include it publicly because I was trying to preserve your privacy, but go ahead. Sure. Would you I, like to because I, yeah, because I think, unfortunately, the way you just presented the last statement it seems a little bit kind of not exactly the way the last thing was left off because I have the very last email that that me and you know and Monroe kind of share with each other and so because mm -hmm. I really don't want to present something that was not exactly accurate because it's not my intention to mislead this group so okay. I have no problem sharing my screen here so give me just one second sure thank you Let's see, give me a second, because I have multiple screens open here. I think this is the screen. Yes. I can just... So you should be able to see this screen here. And, and it says right here. This is the first time I'm seeing this. This yeah. is not what had provided me. So I'm not... I'm not in the business of making things up, ma'am. I'm not. And so I would not come to present something that is misleading or in any way to kind of, you know, be disrespectful or um, untrue. That's just not the way I do business. My goal is simply to explain to you guys that it was never my intention to put anyone here in some kind of off-putting space. My clear purpose here is to try to do my best to document what requests are being made of the organization so I can keep track of them. I have a responsibility to ensure that the information we provide to you guys is consistent and that ultimately we make sure that we give you what it is you ask for. I can understand that it can feel not as you know, as efficient for you and it's not maybe the same way it had been in the past to be able to simply reach out and say, hey, Jahan, I want to come meet with you. 
And my goal is not to make that clumsy for you moving forward. I want you to be able to reach out to those folks and make communication with them. All I'm asking for is when that communication requires that you're asking for different documents or different data for us to pull certain things, that we just have a better way of you know calculating and categorizing what information we're sharing with you. So uh, we don't we have no intention to be less transparent. We intend to be fully transparent when you ask for things. For example, when you asked when we had the conversation about the strip searches, I appeared the very next meeting to be able to answer those questions, but you had already moved past that agenda item. And because of the way the meeting rent was is run, I couldn't just jump in and just start talking once I arrived. So I'm here today prepared to talk about those things. I never have any intention not to talk about the things that I'm asked to talk about. So we want to be transparent. And when it's our intention to be those things. And so we're prepared to do those things and to continue to move that, that needle forward. We want to work with you guys to make sure that we are going to do what's in the best interest of the people we serve. So as I started off saying, is never our intention here to be a block for anything. So if it's parts of this that you struggle with, then we can talk about that. But our purpose here is, as I said, for us to be able to categorize information that comes through the organization so I can make sure that the proper answers are coming through and that the proper people are answering those so there's no confusion between us and you. Thank you. Commissioner Hubert Levy. Um, yes, I, so I appreciate that clarification. And um, just so that I, as the vice chair administration who has taken on the responsibility to follow up on action items from our agendas, just so that I understand how um, the current requests for information ought to have been presented. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, this communication, so, you know, on the, the uh, request of probation for details on the purpose of the strip searches that were identified through the BSCC annual inspection report that there were five authorization forms for strip searches that were reviewed, um, that should have gone to Michelle Kozel? That would have been have helpful. Gone? Yeah, I mean, because as the, here's the thing, that actually conversation happened here in this meeting, right? And so it was really a conversation that's coming from the board proper. That would have been a conversation directly to me. And I was here to take that. And so I would have, like I'm gonna do today, I'm addressing that myself. So that would have went to anyone okay. other than me. So, okay. so I'm going to address it today because it was a question asked directly of me. Had it so, been from any folks in this room, it would have been directly to me. And so I would address it. But if it's a subcommittee issue or subcommittee chair or somebody like that asking a question, all I'm asking is that that come to Michelle so that way we can ensure. And then really it's not. And I want to be careful that we don't necessarily make it about names because it could be someone else if Michelle retires, right. the assistant chief right. is what Yes, so, understood. Yeah. The yeah. assistant chief. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so chief, can I just, that, yeah, go part, ahead. As part of my clarification. Yes. Um, so the only, I guess, other thing that I'm just a little bit unclear about is the kind of the final statement that all the requests originating from the JJDPC will be dealt with as general public record requests, and they'll be processed in accordance with the California Public Records Act. Well, that so that one is really more about bulk data requests. Okay, okay. so let me be clear. So, because I heard I heard some of the consternation in the room. Let me be clear. So that's if there turns to be some like really large bulk data requests. If you're asking for something other than maybe the normal things you guys ask for. If you ask for, hey, how many of this happened, or you know, small things that you normally ask for, we're not going to do that as a data request. But if you're asking for historical data, that's not something that we readily have available and that we need to kind of maybe do something that requires uh, you know, extensive research. We wanna be able to categorize that in a different fashion. And so we're gonna may need time to produce that. And so we may, you know, we wanna treat that the same way. Cause remember you guys have asked for things that we have had to go through county council and produce the official letters for. And we've done that in those instances. And so we treated those like uh, official public record requests. So that's not 
something that is foreign. We've done that with you guys before. And like you said, it was a unique situation with the the cases that you asked for about, but it's not you know unheard of. So we have had situations that have dictated that. So as I said, if there's a situation where you're going to meet with somebody in the hall to ask for the the work that you normally do, that's fine. We we're going to be okay with that. All we're asking is that the administration be aware that it's happening, so we can say that we know it's happening, and then that way we can ensure that we make record that that's going to occur. So it sounds like it's really not who we talk to. It's just that you you and your administration want to know who we're talking to. Is that yes, with that too? okay? That makes more sense because like when I go to to schedule inspections, usually I do that with Yvonne. Now, under this protocol, I would have to do that with Michelle, which seems awkward um, because that mm -hmm. just seems like an added step, right? We've always done it with the person who does compliance and mm -hmm. it typically it's been Sanam and Miss Bustos. So mm -hmm. to me, this seems cumbersome. I, I'm the inspection coordinator, right? To, to have to add that extra layer. Um, you know we're doing inspections. They have to be scheduled by Jan July 15th every year. So I'm just wondering. Maybe as a routine there's certain, request that has a different. Right. There's certain things that may not really apply here that that just sort of, or we're working on a project, you know, that may not necessarily apply to the formality of this protocol. And so when I'm asking, let's say we're in a meeting and, I, and someone asks for additional information on diversion, and when we're in a meeting, typically the person who says, yeah, I'll get back to you as the person to get back to us, never would I have assumed that I have to send an email to Michelle Kozel to request the information that they said they'd bring back. So mm -hmm. that's where the confusion comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a little bit more clarity on that now. So okay. I think we need, I would suggest that in, it, that we um, refine this a little bit to reflect the chief's comments. Okay. Maybe. You know, bring, it to, bring it back to the next meeting. Yeah, and I'm and I'm open to hearing if the, if you have some suggestions of something you would like to me consider as a refinement of the of the suggested language. I'm open to hearing that. And I think it is useful to have it down in writing for you know. I agree. New shift positions and new people. Yeah, because the because the reality is, we are not the people in this room will not be in this room forever. So right. I think it's helpful. Yes, I think that when we come up with it, it should go in our operating policy. I agree. So okay. that everybody has it and we all know what it is. Because it came as quite a shock to me, Chief. I had no idea that this had even happened. And so I kept thinking, why am I not able to communicate? Well, and I'm and I'm shocked that you were not aware considering the document that I just showed you. Yes. Yes, Commission. Um, so I'm taking it a, a different angle. Because I'm going to put my advocacy hat on, which all of us have on anyways. <laughs> but for me, I mean, I've been in juvenile hall. I've been in probation and health families. But the, the issue I have with our, my community is they come to us really late. And the diversion program is like already like not even in play. So um, I would like to see how... If what does advocacy look like in the communication? If there's a Polynesian student that can benefit from our organization's quote unquote develop diversion program, whatever it looks like, I would be able, I would love to share that with the staff to say these are the lessons learned. Yeah. These are the experiences that we've had. This is this might potentially work based on the profile of them being an immigrant, and I already know how it's going to play out. So, for me, that would be beneficial for the policy to look like the breakdown of the actual like sort of intentions, because I'm going to want to know like from Miss Cullen here. You know how many of these Pacific Islander students that I can get on get on diversion mm -hmm. and come and use in my program, and you know, obviously advance their skill sets and or what have you. So the partnership can look very streamlined. Yes, that's what I I kind of like need from this, um, from my advocacy point of view. So I think I think what this policy is to deal with is um, communications from the commission to probation. Yes. 
So mm -hmm. I think that that is something that is. Um, I mean, so if so I had a question, if you brought the your question to the commission meeting, uh -huh. uh, or if it, if it was work on a project of the commission. Then I think that would be covered oh, okay. by this policy. Yeah. yeah. I understand that. Because most of our work really has to do with these two women in the room, right? At juvenile hall and probation services. And so to not have them in this policy just seems awkward to me. They're they're awkward. in they're in the policy, ma'am. All I'm saying is I would like to know directly myself about what's being asked for. That's what I'm asking for. And I okay. think that as the administrator, I have a vested interest in having that information. And also, as you say, if you're present in the meeting and can respond directly to the request, I think that's a that's a great so way. Just to be sure. have him CC on the email. Yeah, that would communication. Be, would that be sufficient to CC you on the email? As let's I say said, I'm. Email. Let's say I'm. I want to reach out to Miss Bustos and say it's inspection time. I need to coordinate the inspection, which is usually takes quite a bit of time in scheduling. So mm -hmm. do I then say, um, do I then say, uh, can I CC Michelle on that? Or am I prohibited from contacting Ms. Bustos until Michelle makes the contact with Ms. Bustos? I'm just trying to understand because that's the next thing that's going to come up. We're, we're going into inspections. Well, I think what I heard uh, Ms. Levy say is that you guys are going to offer us some language to suggest some alternatives. And so, you know, that's if that's an alternative suggestion. I'm like I said, I'm open to hearing those things. Yeah, well, I, I think we should do that. I think we should think. I think that's a great example of a, a, a continuous um, task that will come up every year that probably has a specific way that we can communicate to make it more most effective. Just like the yeah. data in these meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who? Yeah. I, would, I would just like to say thank you uh, for clarifying, Chief. Yes. It, it, that is greatly appreciated. This was a very rigid proposal. I see it was a proposal. And, and I also want to thank you for your flexibility and being open to, to making amendments and putting language in there that everyone is comfortable with and uh, definitely respect and, and understand your intention regarding uh, information that, you know, management needs to be aware of and uh, I respect that. Thank you. So Thanks. Commissioner Huber Levy and I will be in contact with you chief to schedule a time to meet. We'll come up with something. We'll schedule a time to meet so we could go over this before our next meeting. Does that sound okay? I appreciate great. it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. So now um, did your honor want to add any comments to this conversation? Yes. She's here. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, we'll take public comment for this item. Um, this is uh, item number six. So, um, so from, go ahead. Melissa Wilson. Um, this would also be an opportunity to clarify sensitive incident sharing of information, which kind of got lost in the last year or so, but is just as critical. Uh, to improve communication. So as a member of the public, I advocate for that. Yes, and we have that policy. We we'll just maybe need to update it. Oh, include it. Yeah, yeah, all in yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, all in one. So it's okay, very so clear. There's been work on it that I don't know about. Just the one that from before, the one that from before, but I don't know that probation was aware of it. I mean, there was a lot of confusion. Well, it was, de it was determined with Chief P. Oh, okay. And, and we all agreed to it. Okay. That was some years ago. So maybe we'll bring that to the table too, Chief, so you can review it to see if you might want to add um, something new or update it in some way. The, the well, sensitive. I think, when I think I responded to that also, it was a question in uh, the document that you sent us um, attached to your inspection report. I think I responded to that in that document as well. So I'm certainly open to that, that conversation being had as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other public comment? Any okay, public public speakers on Zoom? Please raise your hand now. Okay. No hands are raised. And through the chair, I guess the direction is to bring this item back. Yes. Uh, next month for a vote. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Um, next item on the agenda 
is um, action items. So Chief, um, well, I'll go, let uh, Commissioner Huber lead me. This is her her category, so I'll let you lead. Those. Oh, okay, thank you. You're Chair welcome. Rasmussen. Chair Rasmussen and uh, Chief Keen, thank you for being at the meeting to respond directly to these uh, follow-up requests for information. And the first one, as we just referred to, was coming out of the annual inspection report from the BSCC, which uh, identified five authorization forms for strip searches. Yes. And um, the request was to have details on the purpose of the searches, the number of searches conducted during the inspection year. And there was a re referral um, or reference in the BSCC comments that they implemented a new search authorization form. And so we yes. thought it would be helpful for us to see a copy of that. Yes. So, well, so first question was, or the first statement I'll make was, when there was brought up this meeting about those uh, those strip searches, I know there was a suggestion that it was a contradiction to what I'd originally said in terms of that we didn't have any. And uh, really there was a, I think there was a view shown on my face that I was shocked because the, my thought was, is that we had not had any in a year because I was not aware of any strip searches that occurred in the facility. The reality is that those five that were noted inside the BSC, BSCC inspection actually occurred at intake. There were people that were young people that were actually being brought into facility at admissions. And the reason why those occurred at admissions is because we were actually uh, implementing an old policy based on old prior uh, you know, policies that we thought we still had to enforce, which was that when people brought into the facility we thought that they had maybe potentially dangerous things on them based on crimes they you know, they were alleged to have committed and out in the world. We needed to quote unquote search them a little bit more thoroughly at that time. What happened was the BSCC corrected us and said that you know what that was old policy and that's not current law and that's not current guidance. And so they gave us TA at the time and corrected us and said you know what that's not the case. That actually that when you actually look at what's current law around that it's really based on this premise that you have to be able to demonstrate you have to be able to say very clearly that the only way you can do a strip search you know is that you are able to i want to make sure i read this clearly just one second here just pulling up the language Sorry, just one second. Sorry, document's taking a minute to we'll open up. Excuse me, just one second. That strip searches can only be done if there, you have a reasonable suspicion that the youth is concealing drugs, contraband, or a weapon. So it has to be a substantiated. Um, uh, reasonable suspicion that one of these things are happening. So it has to be something that raises to a very high level. It can't just be that you think and you imagine. You have to also document that, and it has to also then be pre-approved by a manager. So it can't be something that a person just does, you know, on a blind whim. And then so, and then after that happens, that person, you know, that that a decision is scrutinized by that manager and above. And so once we were able to make those adjustments, the BSCC uh, approved our, our kind of revision of our policies at that point. And so when I looked at that and thought that we hadn't had any, any strip searches, it was really based on what we were looking at inside the facility. I was unaware that we had had those five at intake. And so when I represented that we hadn't had any, that was based on my, my knowledge of what had happened in the facility throughout the year not including what had happened actually at admissions. So that was the five that was represented in that space. The actual form that we have now, and I'll share my screen to share this form with you. Just to reduce it so it can be, so hopefully people can see it in one, one take here. Chief is done. We're going to put these over to the next meeting because I don't want to keep you. Okay, so you should hopefully be able to see this in 
And I know the print may be kind of small, but I wanted to kind of have it at least where you can see it all on one screen. I'll make it a little larger, but you'll have to scroll on it. Hopefully that makes it a little easier to read. But pretty much it shows that you, you have a reasonable suspicion. It shows that you have to obtain a signature of an ISM. It shows if you're actually doing what's called a modified strip search or a full strip search. Um, there still has to be an incident report that has to be generated. And it shows you have to have the ISM signature to do so. And it says what the results were. So, and then as management, we follow up on each and every one of these that happens to ensure that the policy was followed. And we wanna see exactly what the narrative was that was written to ensure that this person has followed policy. If the person has not followed policy, then obviously they're gonna be subject to uh, discipline and the process that we have internally. I'm sorry, can you guys hear me? It looks like I froze. Yeah, no, we can hear you. Yeah, you're... I'm sorry, so... I froze. Did you guys hear me? Yes, oh, you did. Okay. okay, sorry about that. So, Chief, so, I just have a question. I think when we asked about this, I was surprised, too, because in my inspection report, I reported out that there were no strip searches because that's what I was told. That's what I believed, that there was none. So when I read the BSCC report, I was equally surprised as you were that we had any. So where then in the future would I go to find where these forms are kept? So then I'm ensuring that I am checking every box and that I am mm -hmm. reporting accurate information. So these, so moving forward, so as you see, this form was produced in June of 2023. So this would be part of your regular inspection documents now moving forward. So they would be visible with all the other documents, your incident reports and everything else. So you wouldn't have to search any place odd to find those. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. No worries. Okay, so for the sake of time, I have um, the, the remaining items on the agenda the presenters have agreed. Oh, go ahead. Another oh, go ahead. Point for sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Keen. And, and it it may. I, I'm okay. not sure that this is something that um, we need to go into in big detail. But uh, one of the other things that we had talked about as an action item was um, diversion programs. And yes, I think we learned a little bit more this evening um, about the typical type of diversion programs that are provided by probation. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that it is such a positive story that it's something that I, I think we should all be very educated on. Yeah. You know, that that is a real plus that less youth are being processed through and, you know, arriving with records or have the opportunity to have their records sealed afterwards after completing a successful diversion program. So I would love to have a bit of a presentation yes. on the diversion programs that probation provides so that, you know, when we get these details, you know, reports out um, during our meetings, we get the numbers that there's a really good understanding by all the commissioners of what that means. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Do you think that's possible, Chief? Because the more, and, and maybe this is something we could incorporate into the training that we have upcoming on April 19th. But the more we know, the more we can bring it out into the community when I interact with the police departments and, and parents and, and organizations. Um, knowing this information is very valuable. You know, maybe we can spend some time when we get together. Um, that may be a bet that may be an easier environment to do that. Um sure. when we yeah. on the 19th. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, our goal with diversion, as I'm sure was already explained, is certainly to try to divert mm -hmm. as many youth as we possibly can. But the reality is. We still believe that the city and local diversion programs are still better than even what we do in probation. I've always been a firm believer that, you know, those are the, the to me, the, the gold standard models. You know, what we do is on a, honestly great, but I would prefer us not even be in the business of diversion. I would love it if every city and every police department had their own diversion model. Because if, if they were the ones that were in the business of doing that, then we wouldn't have the young people have to touch the system at all. Because I, I think that even the, even the minimal part of the, them touching the system with our hands, uh, I think still is, you know, is one, one touch too many. So 
I appreciate that you guys recognize that it's a very positive thing that we're trying to do in this space. Um, but my hope is, is that, you know, is in these, these really tough budget times for the cities, that the programs that are out there, they don't become um, victims of a very difficult uh, budget crisis for, for localities. So, but I do look forward to talking more about them when we get together. That's an excellent idea. I think let's- Thank let's, you all so much. I apologize for yeah, keeping thanks. everyone over. The remaining items will be continued until next month. Thank you all for being here. Yes. And those are, here. And those are items uh, eight, nine, and 10. Those are being continued to the next meeting. And through the chair, the meeting is not adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate your time. Thank you. The time is now 7.20 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you.